Okay, uh, today we're going to have a teach back on a lot of conditions mostly affecting the endocrine system and of course your GI tract, right? So can anybody tell me exactly what is the meaning of the word endocrine gland? How is that different from an exocrine gland? No ducks. Who has no ducks? Endocrine. endocrine gland. What about exocrine gland? They have ducks, right? So example, if you have here the surface of the skin, there's a duck, this is a sweat gland, and what is found inside the sweat gland? Sweat or perspiration. So the sweat will travel to the ducks, then to look. It will come out where? On the surface of the skin. Same thing with the oil gland, right? If you have the surface of the skin here, the duct is present, the oil gland will allow the oil, otherwise known as sebum, to come out on the surface of the skin. In the case of endocrine glands, so this is exocrine, endocrine glands, what happens? No ducts. So there is no duct, you only have a gland, but what do these glands produce? What? Enzymes. Hormones. Hormones. Where did you get to the enzyme? I don't understand what you say. What did the endocrine glands produce? Hormones. Hormones, okay? And how does uh, how how would it be possible for these hormones to travel to reach their target organs? So a blood vessel, right? So you have a organ there, and that organ or gland has a blood vessel. Of course, every gland has a what? A blood vessel, artery or vein, like thyroid gland, thyroid artery, thyroid vein. So essentially, the hormones here can travel where? The blood in order to reach is what? Target organ. Okay, so that's very, very basic. You learn that from anatomy, okay? So, as I've given you in the study guide, there is a long list of endocrine disorders. Which do you think is the most important, the one that I give you in the list of endocrine disorders? The most commonly seen in your nursing board exam? Of course, okay? So when the, you hear of the word diabetes mellitus, or mellitus, what organ is involved here? Okay, very good. Pancreas. So diabetes mellitus, or let me just make a shortcut to DM, involves the pancreas. If you remember, the pancreas has the alpha cell, the beta cell, and the delta cell. What does the alpha cell secrete? Huh? What? Okay, glucagon. What about the beta cell? Okay, and what about the delta cell? Okay, somatostatin. Okay, and we also emphasize that these are cells found in the islets of Langerhans, right? So the islets of Langerhans is the endocrine component of the pancreas. Now remember, the pancreas is quite unique because it is both endocrine and then what? So the endocrine part is this. Well, the exocrine part is, of course, well, you have the acinus or acinus that secretes what? The pancreatic enzymes, right? Like protease, amylase, pancreatic amylase, lipase. So this is a unique organ because it is both exocrine and then at the same time what? The endocrine. It makes it endocrine because of the presence of the islets of longer hands, which produces hormones releasing to the blood circulation, right? Okay. So let's deal first with the hormone insulin because this is the one that is lacking in diabetic patients, right? Okay. So pretend this is the cell. This is the cell. Nucleus, cytoplasm, nucleus, cytoplasm. Okay. And every cell or cells or t group of cells are called tissues. There will always be a what? A capillary. What's a capillary again? The smallest blood vessel. The smallest blood vessel. vessel. Therefore, what is found inside this blood vessel? Blood. blood. Precisely. Okay. So, the blood is here. Now remember, when you eat, this is your mouth. This is your neck. And then you, it goes where? It goes to the okay, stomach here. And then what? The small intestine, right? 
So every time you eat, you chew the food, you, it's called mastication, you swallow the food called deglutition, it goes into the stomach, it's further away. Churn and digest it mechanically. And then what happens here? What happens to the food we eat? The glucose. They go absorbed to the wall by the process of diffusion. The food we eat, the protein, the carbohydrates, lipids, they go to the wall. And what is found in the wall? Remember? Mucosa, some mucosa, smooth muscle layer, and then what? Serosa. The muscle layer contains what? Blood vessels too, just like here. See? In other words, whatever you eat goes into the blood circulation. And remember, and what happens? You go to the hepatic portal vein, and where is the food stored? What organ? Okay. So this vein is a unique vein. Instead of uh, bringing blood to the heart, it brings blood to the liver. That's why it's called hepatic portal vein. Now, this is not the same as hepatic vein. So the food we eat is stored there, whatever we eat. Glucose is stored in the form of glycogen. Right? We have proteins and lipids or fats. Now, question now is, so when you eat and the food we eat has sugar, so when you eat and the food has glucose or sugar, the glucose goes where? Into the blood circulation. After a meal, and if the meal contains sugar or glucose. So let's say your normal blood sugar level ranges from 60 to 120. So at 6 a.m. you ate, by around 6.05 or 6.03, what happens to the blood sugar? It goes above 120. Anything below 60 is what? Hypoglycemia. Anything above 120 or 115 would be what? Hyperglycemia. So you would expect your blood sugar to what? To rise. Because you just had your meal, and the food went into the stomach and into the small intestine where the food is absorbed. It goes into the blood circulation here in the wall of the small intestines, and that's the reason why your blood sugar goes up. So if you eat, where does the sugar go? Into the blood, and what happens to the blood glucose levels? They become very high, like 200 or 300, right? It goes like 200 here, goes up. Now, remember the word homeostasis, equilibrium? What will the beta cells do? The beta cells secretes what? Where? Into the blood circulation because it's an endocrine gland. Now, this now, the letter I, which represents insulin, is now in the blood. Now, who is going to need that glucose or sugar? The cell. The cell. Okay? So, remember the analogy I gave this in class when you were in anatomy with me? It's like what? Insulin is like a key in a very simple way. What does the key do? Open the door. Okay? So pretend that there are three doors per cell. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Three cells, three times three, how many doors to open? Nine doors, okay? So, let's just stick to one door. One eye will attach to the receptor for insulin on the surface of a cell, and therefore what? Open the door, and once the door is open, who will go inside? So I would go here, attach here, open the door. Glucose now is able to enter because the door is now what? Open. open. Does that make sense? So in the normal scheme of things, with nine doors, how many keys do I need? Nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Does that make sense? Now what happens therefore if a patient lacks insulin and there is no there is no key without the key will you be able to open the door and if I cannot open the door where does the glucose stay in the blood and what happens to the blood glucose levels they remain high so with the insulin it's supposed to go back to normal levels right because the glucose in the blood goes where into the cell, that's why the glucose level should go back to normal levels. But in the absence of insulin, without the key to open the door, guess what? The glucose levels remain what? High because they will remain inside the blood. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Right? Now, there are three types of diabetes mellitus. What were they? Type 1. Type 1. Two. Type 2. Type 2. And then what? Gestational. 
In type one, what is the mechanism involved here? Autophysiologic mechanism. What kind of mechanism involved? Autoimmune. There we go. Which means that it is usually what? Young onset is also known as IDDM, which means insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So these are young people, young children, teenagers, who apparently had a what? Prior infection, like maybe viral, bacterial infection, and the body developed antibodies or you know, immune response against the antigen or the enemy. But at the same time, what will these antibodies or immune response do? Destroy what? Completely. All the beta cells are destroyed. What happens to the amount of insulin secreted or the pancreas? Zero. Does that make sense? So without the key, now I might as well get my key, I might forget this key. Without the key to open the door, then there is no way for the what? Glucose to enter the cell. Because the key is the insulin, right? Okay, now, so you have hyperglycemia. Now, the bottom line, therefore, is that autoimmune, autoimmune response, all the cells are destroyed, and therefore there is no insulin at all. Now, how do you compare them to type 2? This is non-insulin dependent. Why? Because the beta cells will produce what? A little. A little insulin. What does that mean? What is the ideal? In the ideal world, you should have at least what? This is just an analogy. How many keys do I need? Nine. Nine. But here, they only probably have one. Instead of nine, they have what? Two or three. This is just an analogy to explain the things that I am supposed to discuss with you. So if I only have two or three keys, what happens? Every glucose has to wait for their turn to be able to go in because enter, open, go in. See? It will take time for it to be able to open all the doors at the same time. In as much as not all of the glucose can enter the cell, where do they stay for the meantime while waiting for their turn? So will you still have hyperglycemia here? Of course, blood glucose level goes up, just like here. There's hyperglycemia, which is above 115 or 120 or 125, okay? Does that make sense? But the good news is that little means it's better than zero. Little means there is luck, but we can what? So what do we do with these patients? Treatment will include what? Insulin injection, right? What about type one? Of course, only insulin can be because it's insulin dependent because there is zero insulin. How do you treat them? Insulin injections. Now, here, aside from giving insulin injections for type 2, what else can we do? Oral hypoglycemic drugs. What do these drugs do? It will make the beta cells produce to produce more what? Insulin. Instead of just producing three, we want them to produce more than three, maybe at least eight or nine. So there are two methods. One would be injection of insulin and here oral drug. Now can we give oral drugs here? Hypoglycemic drugs? No, because how can they stimulate the beta cells when the beta cells are completely what? Destroyed or damaged by an autoimmune immune response. Does that make sense? Now, Let's move on to type one. Now, on type two, in diabetes mellitus, there will always be hyperglycemia. Hyper means increased blood sugar levels. The question now is, what are the three P's of diabetes mellitus? P for what? Polyuria. Polyuria. Another P. Poly what? Vega. And what is polydipsia? Okay, why would they have excessive thirst? Because they have polyuria, which means what? You have excessive amount of urine output, what would that be? Fluid volume deficit or fluid volume overload? Deficit, you can be dehydrated. And what will the hypothalamus be able to detect? Low levels of blood plasma and water, it will make you drink and drink because you have now polydipsia. Do you understand? Okay. So, the idea therefore is that we need to give insulin, right? Mm -hmm. 
and you give a diabetic diet to these patients. The other problem is that in diabetic patients, aside from the three Ps, and I do not have the time to discuss all in detail, you have all the possible complications. Like, for example, in diabetic patients, do they have diabetic retinopathy? Yes. Damage to the retina, could they become blind? Yes. Do they have any form of diabetic neuropathy or yes. nerve damage, yes. whereby they cannot feel and the, the, the feet are numb, which will make them become prone to what? A wound or a, an injury to the feet without even them feeling the pain because there is numbness as a result of diabetic neuropathy from the word nerve. Pathy means pathology. What about the kidneys? Can you develop diabetic nephropathy? Yes, yes you can. What about diabetic angiopathy? Mm -hmm. Lack of blood circulation to the feet and the legs and other parts of the body. Yes. Because what does diabetes do? It promotes what? Atherosclerosis. In fact, I would presume this is the reason why all the other organs are affected. Do you have any blood vessels or arteries to the eye? Yes. The retinal arteries, right? What about the kidney? Yes. Renal arteries. What about the nerves? Yes. Because the nerve is a tissue, right? So if these arteries to each of these, the retina, the nerves, the kidney are affected, including the heart, particularly the coronary arteries, if there's a lot of fat deposit because diabetes is shown to promote atherosclerosis, will that affect the blood flow to the retina, the heart, the feet, the legs, and the kidneys? Yes. And that can explain how come a lot of organs are affected because this is a systemic disease. A lot of organs are affected, even the ability to have an erection, because now it will affect the parasympathetic nerve for what? Erection. The nervi orientis will be affected because there is not enough blood flow to this nerve tissue. So a diabetic husband may end up becoming what? Impotent. <laughs> Having what? ED. And what is ED? Erectile dysfunction. So before you marry somebody, ask him, do you have diabetes? <laughs> but I will still marry because that's, much, that's how much I love you, okay? Sex is secondary. Love is in the air, okay? I'm just joking. I don't want you to be discriminating people with diabetes. Okay. Now, the idea, therefore, is that and you can see the reason why it's such a common problem, and a lot of problems have solution, right? You have to regularly monitor them, even in the nursing board exam, how to take care of the foot, even how to cut what? The nails, we try to avoid the curved type of cutting because you might end up with an ingrown toenail which becomes infected, and what do you do with the foot? Amputation. Because of the angiopathy, what is angiopathy again? The, de the development of atherosclerosis in the small arteries and which affects all the other organs like the retina, the kidneys, and the nerves, and the heart. The blood supply to the feet is minimal or diminished. So we try to avoid wearing what? Tight-fitting shoes. Because of the effect on the nerves and the people feel numbness on their feet, are we going to make them walk barefooted? No. no. Do you understand? So it's always primary prevention, okay? The numbness makes them prone to an injury to the foot. And because of the lack of blood flow, because of the angiopathy, the healing will be slow. And unfortunately, if it gets worse, it gets infected, and you end up with a diabetic foot, and it develops gangrene, where instead of blue, mm -hmm. cyanosis present, it becomes black, which means it's getting it's dying. And what do we do? Why do we amputate? Because if we do not amputate, that dead tissues there will be a source of a possible focus of infection, which will spread throughout the body. It's called septic infection, septicemia. And you may end up developing septic shock. And you can actually, what? And rest in. Six feet under the permanent resident at Forest Lawn Cemetery. Do you understand? So in any disease process, why is this subject so important? It's because of you as nurses 
will be taking care of normal patients or abnormal? Abnormal. People who are sick. And you have to understand why was the insulin ordered by the doctor in both instances, right? Is that clear? When we inject insulin, where is the best site? Okay, we said sub-Q, right? What does sub-Q mean? Remember the layers of the skin? Epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous layer. In fact, the word sub means below the skin. Because if you remember your anatomy, the layers of the skin only has two, right? Epidermis and what? Dermis. Dermis. And here would be what? Sub-Q or subcutaneous layer, as otherwise known as hypodermis. Now, if you also remember, are there blood vessels here? Are there blood vessels? No. What about here? Blood vessels here? Yes or no? Yes. Dermis. What about sub-Q? Many blood vessels. Is this where you have too much fat? Yes. Remember in the anatomy slides, histological slides? Okay, so we inject these insulin by sub-Q technique. It is not intramuscular, it is not IV, but in this case sub-Q. Now where is the best place? Abdominal wall, because the absorption, when you inject sub-Q, will be what? Uniform. But what do we do with the injection size? Are we going to inject in one side or are we going to rotate in the four quadrants? Remember, if you were to draw an imaginary line in the navel, vertically and horizontally have four quadrants, right? We have to rotate. Why do we need to rotate the injection sites? Hmm? Yes? You know what? Okay, so that you will have damage the fat tissue. It's called lipodystrophy. Okay. You want to avoid what? Lipo Dystrophy. Okay. What does lipo mean? Fat. Because there's so much fat in the abdominal wall. Look at my another prime example. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> okay. Now, if you do not rotate, if you keep injecting, you damage the fat tissue. That's not a good thing to do, right? Do you understand? True. So. Eventually, I don't have to go into details when you go to coordinates and you talk about the different types of this rapid acting and slow acting. Long acting means you inject at 7 in the morning, the next time you inject would be what? One day later or 24 hours, long acting. But unfortunately, these long acting insulins are also a slow acting, which means if I inject that kind of insulin at 7, the effect will take place maybe about one or two hours later. But once it takes effect, it will be good for how many hours? 24 hours. Long acting, but slow acting. Now, some of them are fast acting like regular insulin. When you inject within five or minutes or two minutes, it will already have an effect to lower the blood glucose, but the duration of action will only be probably, what, two to three or five hours, which means you have to keep on injecting, what? Every three or five hours. Now, I don't know if it's being done, still done, but when I was doing review for nurses before, they would combine, what, rapid acting with, what? slow acting, so I inject only once. So if I inject at seven, the, the combination of the rapid acting will allow it to what? Lower the blood sugar within two minutes, but the other component, which is long duration acting, will last for the whole day, so I only have to inject what? Only once. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so that is why diabetes is so important because of all the possible complications and disease and treatment, right? Okay. Now, before I forget, in dealing with type 1, because of zero insulin, there is no food for the cell. There is no glucose entering the cell. Therefore, what will the cell use as an alternate source of energy? Fat. In the process of utilizing fat as a source of energy in type 1 diabetic patients, what do they produce? Ketone bodies. And what are these? Are they acidic or acidic? Acidic. That's the reason why in type 1 only they develop what? Diabetic ketoacidosis. On the other hand, in type 2, is there zero insulin or little insulin? So, if the presence of the insulin will allow the glucose to what? Enter. So will they develop ketones? No. no. 
when they use fat as an alternate source of energy. No, because now we have little into allowing the glucose to enter the cell, but it only takes us a longer time. Does it make sense? Okay. On the other hand, what will they develop here? Hyper what? Non-ketotic, hyper what? Glycemic, hyperosmolar syndrome, right? Some book would say HONK, H-O-N-K, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome. I think in your book it was something about non-ketotic, hyperglycemic conditions, right? Why hyperglycemic? Because, as I said, you only have three keys, you need nine keys to open the doors, so they would be what? Concentrated. It's hyper or smaller means what? Highly concentrated. It's because there's so much sugar in the blood. Do you understand, right? So non-ketotic because there is no ketone bodies produced, because the glucose can enter what? The cell. Does that make sense? Non-ketosis or non-ketotic, hyperglycemic, hyper-smolar, which means high sugar, hyper-smolar means it's highly concentrated. Like for example, if you have two glasses, water is here, glass, you put 10 tablespoons, you want one tablespoon, which is hyper-smolar. The one is concentrated with so much sugar, okay? Does that make sense, okay? Now, that's why we need to understand this and how it's going to be important for diabetic. In gestational, it's simply what? Pregnant, Pregnant women. And oftentimes, eventually, as time goes by, they can become what? Type two. Type two. Type two. Not only that, these women who have gestational diabetes are prone to the development of what we call what? LGA, large gestational age babies. What do you mean by that? Large babies. Nine to ten pounds babies. Good job. <laughs> Why is it bad for that to happen? Not only will it be difficult to deliver the baby, and I had a, I had a friend of mine who had this problem. He was She was diabetic. She was a friend of mine in an old school I used to teach. And apparently, she went to Kaiser and what would you do with if it's a 10 pound baby and you're diabetic? Are you going to do a normal vaginal delivery or C-section? Now, what do you think the people there do? What did they do for her? They allowed her to deliver the baby to the vaginal delivery. To cut the story short, the baby suffered. Why? Because the baby was so big. This is the vagina here. You know that is? Oh shit, I'm stuck here, mom. So these people. But the baby got stuck, they attempted to what? And he had brachial plexus injury. Brachial plexus injury. So one arm was paralyzed when the baby was born. Remember when you were a baby inside the crib, you would be what? crying with both feet. Oh, let's say this is the bed here. So what did the baby do? Look, mom, brachial plexus injury, not moving. It paralyzed. really sad. Now what else? These mothers who are diabetic and pregnant, have you heard of the condition called fetal death in utero? You know what that means? FDU? The baby dies inside the mother's womb. How sad could that be if this baby is about to be delivered in one week? traumatic for a mother to lose the baby when the baby is about to be delivered let's say next week or two weeks from now so if you are my wife and you're diabetic I will be hooked to you I will be beside you the whole time no I'm just kidding I will provide you with a fetal motor recording device hooked to myself with apps you know <laughs> and I can see the fetal heart rate of my baby while in your womb and if I can see that there's deceleration or acceleration in the fetal heart rate, I will immediately call you, we need to go to the hospital to have the baby delivered at ASAP. No, I do not see this. The J Gamma Foundation will help you. Okay. So the bottom line is that these mothers 
and the baby is at risk of dying inside the mother's womb. I'm not trying to scare these diabetic mothers. I'm just st stating a reality fact that it happens. And I, I was not joking about if you really are my wife and you're diabetic, I will make sure that you are, I will not let you work. You will just be there in, I have to be rich first so I have to afford all these things, right? So, <laughs> which I am not. So, so it's just my, I have a dream. And I come out with this device that can monitor my baby 24-7. And I will have a recording in my, in my car. In my, the baby's monitoring devices will be everywhere. Anything that is going to be acceleration of the fetal heart rate and deceleration, it will create a sound. So even though I'm teaching here, goodbye. Because I need to go to my baby. And the helicopter should be waiting upstairs. And another helicopter will bring my wife to the hospital. In, or better yet, I will buy the hospital. So my wife will stay in the hospital. If you're not rich, why are you teaching? Uh, that's exactly the reason why I'm not rich, that's why I'm here. So. If I were a rich man, I would not be teaching here, of course. Now, of course, I love to teach, that's why I don't care. The money is secondary, teaching is what I like to do, right? Now, the bottom line, therefore, is, is diabetes a common Ill illness? Yes. Will this come out in the nursing board exam? Yes. Most likely, yes, right? And make sure even proper food care will come out. Is that clear? Now, let's move on. So, other endocrine disorders such as what? Cushing's and Addison's disease, right? I think somebody will be talking about this. But let me just briefly talk about the salient points. Why? Because, again, as I have said, so in Cushing's disease and Addison's, what organ is involved? Adrenal gland. Now, if you remember, the adrenal gland has two parts, adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla, right? Okay. So the adrenal gland, as we know, adrenal gland, as we know, has the adrenal cortex and the medulla, right? <coughs> and as you remember, if you recall, the adrenal gland, the cortex has two hormones. What are these two hormones? Mineral or what? Corticoid. So it's called corticoid because it comes from the cortex, otherwise known as what? And the other one would be what? Gluco. Corticoid, again, because corticoid from the adrenal cortex and glucose, which means what does it do to the blood glucose level? Increase. Increase the blood glucose. And if you remember, the adrenal gland is part of the flight or fright organ, right? The system. So you need more blood glucose in a sympathetic response. Now, what's another name for this? Cortisol, right? Now, what does aldosterone do? Water and sodium what? Very good. And potassium what? Excretion by what organ? Including this, also the kidney, right? So why do you need to know this? It's very simple. If you do not know what these hormones do, then obviously you will be what? What is L-O-S-T? Lost. Lost. <laughs> On the signs and symptoms of people with Cushing's disease. So if you happen to have Cushing's, therefore, Cushing's, what does Cushing's disease mean? Increase what? Number one, increase aldosterone. And therefore, as such, what will it do? It will make you retain more what? Water. water okay. Increase water retention. What about the sodium? Increase, Increase sodium retention. Yeah, right? And what happens to your sodium levels in the blood? Okay. It goes up. It's called hypernatremia, which happens to be what? Greater than 145 milli equivalents per liter. On the other hand, because this hormone called aldosterone promotes potassium excretion, 
in the urine, what happens to the blood? What Hashem does in the blood? It goes down. If you have a lot of what? Of dosa. And when you have Cushing's disease. So if you have increased potassium excretion in the urine, by the kidney, what will happen to your blood potassium levels? It will be less than what? Less than 3.5, which is what? Hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Now, what about the effect of cortisol, number two? What would you expect to see in these patients if you have increased cortisol, increased aldosterone? What happens to the blood glucose levels? Very high. It's called hyper. It's called what? Hyper glycemia. Are you following me? Yes. The idea, therefore, is there is nothing that you cannot answer if your background in anatomy and physiology is very solid and strong. If you know what is normal functions of these hormones and where the gland it comes from, you can also know what will happen. In Cushing's disease, there are high levels of the hormones, mineral and corticoid, otherwise known as aldosterone. You have high levels of cortisol, otherwise known as glucocorticoid, and this will be the effect. Now what about Addison's disease? Everything will be what? No. The opposite. Decrease hormones of aldosterone, what would you have? Poly what? Poly urea. So you end up with what? Instead of retaining water, you have what? Water loss because of polyuria. So what would be the effect on blood pressure here? Drop where? Blood pressure here in Cushing's? High because of hypervolemia. Where is the hypervolemia? Cushing, where is the hypovolemia? Does that make sense? Okay. What about your sodium levels? Everything will be the opposite. Hyponatremia, less than 135, because the normal range of sodium is between 135 to 145. What about your potassium? Hyper. Hyper, the opposite. And it will be greater than what? Five milliequivalents per liter. Do you understand? What about blood sugar levels? No. <coughs> you have hypoglycemia there. <coughs> now, I know you say, oh my God, this is so overwhelming already, Dr. Gamo. What is the wisest thing you can do? Remember. Remember only one with the higher levels of the hormones because if you know what the hormone does, then you'll know what it will do. High, 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 high and you will know. Everything on the right side will be what? The opposite. the opposite. If you're taking the nursing board exam, I would strongly suggest you only remember the one with the high levels of the hormones. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, let's say nursing intervention. A patient, which patient do you think will benefit by giving a banana? Cushing's or Addison's? Cushing's. Cushing's or Addison's? Cushing's. Okay, a while ago, some people I could hear some say, Addison's. No. What does banana have? Potassium. Are we going to give Addison's patients with banana when they have high per like no. kalemia? No. No. What would happen if you give them more potassium in the form of the banana? No. They will what? What happens? <laughs> Who killed the patient? The nurse. Oh my God, the banana. <laughs> so it's not the, the nurse, it's the patient. The banana killed the patient. But who gave the banana? The nurse. Oh my gosh. So I'm, not, I'm just making a joke out of this. Do you understand the role that you play? The lack of knowledge here and the lack of application will surely affect the fate of your patients. I just hope one of these days as I get older and sicker when I'm 70, 80, I get to have a nurse like you, smart, competent, 
critical thinking nurses who will get an A in this class, that they will not give me a banana if I have been diagnosed with one. So who do you think will benefit with a banana? It's so simple. Banana equals potassium. Cushing's low levels of potassium. What do I give? Banana. <laughs> what about KCL? What is KCL? Potassium. But with cardiac monitoring, because if you give too much of this KCL, can that cause cardiac arrest and cardiac arrhythmias? Yes. So we need to be very careful and do put the, you know what's a cardiac monitor? You see in the ICU? Does that make sense? Yes. In fact, I, I used to share this as a joke. Remember those old James Bond movies? You probably were not born yet. I grew up in those movies. The Spy Who Loved Me, to Russia with Love in the 1960s, you know. The Russian Cold War with the Americano. The Americano versus the Russiano. No, I'm just kidding. I came up with the words Russiano, Americano. So Russians and Americans were having a cold war. And they had agents, double agent, triple agent. I don't know what kind of agent. <laughs> so this double agent wears a white uniform like this or a gown. Stethoscope goes to the opposite agent. And nobody's watching. He goes in syringe with KCL, potassium chloride. Inject into the IV tubing. And the, the line there, you know the cardiac button? So can this kill people? Yes. Now don't use that as a tool to kill your patients. Please, por favor, be careful. Because we are here to what? Save lives. Right? The knowledge you get is to save, not to kill. Please, knowledge is important, but not for the wrong reasons, right? Okay, now, so obviously, who do you think will require fluid replacement? People with Cushing's or Addison's disease? Because they are what, dehydrated? There's fluid volume deficit? Are we going to replace fluids here? No. There's too much fluids, OMG. So it's just common sense. Critical thinking requires common sense thinking. But common sense thinking will only be possible if you have the proper what? Knowledge. The lack of knowledge is ignorance. And ignorance is going to be dangerous. Because the patients will or could die if your nurse is incompetent. Do you understand? What about Saline solutions is made up of what? Sodium chloride solutions, IV. Where do I give these solutions? Addison. Patients with Cushing's or Addison's Addison. disease? Addison. Why? Because, because, because the sodium the levels are low. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think will happen if the nurse gives this solution to patients with Cushing's? It will make it what? Better or worse? Why? Because this contains sodium. People with cushing already have high levels of what? Do you understand the beauty of logical thinking and reasoning? A smart nursing student understands the reason or the what? Rationale or explanation of the things we do as nurses and doctors. We are men and women of science. We use the knowledge we acquire in anatomy, physiology, microbiology, and of course here in this class, pathophysiology, in order to what? Save lives. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, other features here, like where do you see a bronze pigmentation? Bronze pigmentation. Very good. Where do you find truncal obesity? Where do you find purple striae? Where do you find hirsutism? Women with hair and hair and hair in the breast. Imagine Cushing's women, hair, hair. 
Like, especially me, I don't have hair, and then the, my partner has hair. <laughs> Who is the male here? I'm just joking. I do not want to offend anybody. I'd like to apologize for those women with Cushing's. Oh you might think, oh my God, Dr. Gamo is insensitive. Of course, I just wanted to make you laugh because you're about to take a quiz in a short time. <coughs> yeah, do you understand? Yes. Now, why would they have here statism? Can anybody give me an, a logical explanation? See, that is how you become smart. By ask, asking yourself, how can I be able to explain all these signs and symptoms based on the knowledge I have of anatomy and physiology? Hirsutism, spelled as H-I-R-S-U-T-I-S-M, is defined as the presence of excessive hair growth in the face, like you have a mustache or in the hair, like uh, Ashot over here. Ashot, show me your hair. <laughs> So hair. much hair, yeah. yeah. There, so much hair. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine you're a woman with that kind of hair? <laughs> I don't want it. Or, here in the chest, your breast is there, but there's a hair. <laughs> Anybody knows why? I think. Uh, <coughs> you think? Cortex is responsible for sex hormone production as well. <coughs> okay, you are right. The little gland has a portion that secretes androgenic hormones. Androgen means male hormone. Do you understand? Okay. Is that clear, class? Now, let's move on. Let's move on to, um, I think in, your, I did, uh, in the study guide, I mentioned what? What is the difference with diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus and SI insipidus? Diabetes what? Insipidus. And the other one is what? S-I-A-D-H, syndrome of inappropriate what? What's S-I-D-H, inappropriated what? A-D-H, okay. So, which means what? Which one has high levels of A-D-H, the antidiuretic? Now, where is the antidiuretic hormone produced? Hypothalamus, and stored where? in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. It's only released when you have dehydration, when you have hypovolemia, because what does ADH do? Anti means, what is diuresis? Making wee wee. So this hormone, anti-diuresis, means it will make the kidney what? Retain the water. So which one do you think will have high levels of ADH? Okay, increase ADH, what about here? Lower ADH, therefore, because you have low ADH, will you be able to store the water? No, no. You develop what? Poly. So that's the reason why people were ignorant. They thought that it's similar to what? Diabetes mellitus. But the mechanism in diabetes, diabetes mellitus has to do with what? Osmotic diarrhea. What is osmotic diarrhea? Remember this, the nephron? Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, loop of Henle. Distal tubule, right? Collecting ducts. In diabetic patients, there's too much sugar in the blood. And where does the sugar go? Or glucose go? The urine. So what will this glucose do? Attract more what? More water. More water. And that's the reason why they have poly. It's called osmosis, osmotic diuretic. But the problem here has nothing to do with that. But rather, it's more of a low levels of ADH. So if you have low levels of ADH, you cannot retain the water. You develop what? Polyuria, you become dehydrated, you get hypovolemic shock. On the other hand, you will be what? What happens here? You retain what? Water. 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 So instead of hypo, you have hypervolemia. Fluid volume overload. Does it make sense? OK. What about people with? Hyper and versus hypo, thyroidism. So hyper, thyroidism versus what? Hypo, thyroidism, right? So hyper means increased T3, T4, thyroid hormone levels. T3 stands for triiodothyronine. Increased T3 means what? Triiodo. Thyronine, and what is T4? Thyroxine. 
The hormones of the thyroid gland, particularly these two, are important for what? Cellular what? Metabolism. And where did we define cellular metabolism? Metabolism is defined as a sum of all the chemical reactions that takes place inside the cell. It could either be building, which is anabolism, or it could be breakdown, which is called what? Catabolism. Okay, now, so are these hormones important for every single cell in your body? Are they important for the brain cells? Are they important for the bone cells? That's why if you have hypothyroidism, decreased T3, T4, in children, it's called what? Cretinism, which means there's not enough of the hormone. What happens to this height? Dwarfism is present, which you're not able to stimulate the bone cells because there is no thyroid hormone. What else? Will that affect the brains? They become mentally what? Retarded. Retarded. <coughs> There's a reason why. If somebody will tell you, you are a cretin, what will you tell that person? Same to you, thank you. <coughs> I'm smart. Yes. <coughs> I know you're trying to insult me by telling me I'm stupid. <coughs> I'm retarded. No. No! Because I know what that word means. It is you! <laughs> right? <laughs> now, is there hope for these children? They lack the hormone, what do we do? Levothyroxine, hormone replacement. Don't you love anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology, and medicine? You lack the hormone, what do you need? Hormone replacement. <coughs> Are we going to give hormone replacement here? You must be kidding me. If you give hormone replacement here when there's too much of the hormone, you must be crazy. <laughs> what is crazy? <laughs> Remember the rich crazy Asians? <laughs> crazy. Why would you give too much hormone? You give hormone replacement, you must be crazy. <laughs> here, okay. <laughs> because you lack the hormone in hypothyroidism. So what do we give here? Anti what? Such as what? Propyl, thio, uracil, right? Does it make sense? You give levothyroxine hormone replacement here, but not here. In the adult, we call it, in some in the case we probably hear the word blitz edema, yeah, right? You have a tendency to retain water, okay? Now, my question is this, signs and symptoms. Which do you think will manifest where? So here you expect high metabolism. Which one would you expect to go tachycardia? Increase metabolism, increase heart rate, decrease heart rate. Slower metabolic rates. Which one will have weight loss? And which one will have weight gain? What do you notice? Is the opposite? Increase heart rate, decrease heart rate. Hyperthyroid, increase heart rate, weight loss. Which one would manifest with cold intolerance? Which one would manifest with heat intolerance? So therefore, who do you think part of nursing intervention is in the question in the board exam? Which do you think would benefit by giving them a blanket or a jacket? High pole, of course. Oh my God, you're so smart. You will all pass the nursing board exam with flying colors for that question alone. <laughs> this is not because my joke. You understand? Yes. Blanket, jacket, cold intolerance. Which do you think will suffer from diarrhea? Which will suffer from constipation? Everything is slow, including the peristalsis. <laughs> Diarrhea, constipation, isn't that beautiful? Is it the opposite of things in this life? Hyper, high, T3, T4 levels. Hypo, low levels. But the important thing is to be able to recognize which one is which. So if I say Graves' disease, what is that? 
If I say mix edema, if I say cretinism, if I do you get the point? What if I say toxic goiter? Toxic means increased levels. Toxic goiter. What is goiter? Enlargement of the and where is the thyroid gland found? In front of the neck. Increasing the size of the thyroid gland is called thyromegaly, also known as goiter, G-O-I-T-E-R. Can this also be due to iron, iron, iodine deficiency? Yes. Now, what is the natural source of iodine? Salt. Salt is wrong. Because what did man do? Man placed the salt with iodine, iodine into the salt. So it is not natural. What is the natural source of iodine? Fish. Shellfish. Seafood. And where do you find the seafood? In the sea. <laughs> Don't you love this class? So simple. Where do you find the seafood? In the sea. Can you imagine? Who do you think will develop enlargement of the thyroid gland as manifested in goiter? People living in Big Bear 200 years ago or people living near the coastal area of the Pacific Ocean? So what did the World Health Organization do? They said, we will mandate from now on, we will have to put iodine where? Salt. Where? Salt. Where? Salt. <laughs> who, who placed the iodine in the salt? Man? man. Is that man-made? Yes. Is that natural? No. Is that man-made? Yes. How come so? You should all get an A in this class. Huh? If you just answer everything in the study guide, I guarantee you! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all get the perfect score. <laughs> you understand? Okay? <laughs> hypo, hyper, cursing, Addison, as they, is it as a, a, GH, type 1, type 2, gestational. Okay. Okay. Now, GI. Before, before we, we might run out of time, we still have a report. Don't you, are you excited for the reporting today? No. I am. No. <laughs> I will no longer be talking, you will be doing talking, it's more professional. Okay, let's continue with, okay. Hepatitis. What does HEPA mean? <laughs> hepatitis means infection or inflammation of the liver as a result of a viral infection, right? You have hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. So which one is due to a Food contaminated water, water, food contamination. A, a. a and e. e. What about the B, the C, and the D? Blood. Give me a B. Give me a C. <laughs> Give me a D. Blood. For example, if the blood is tainted with this, you're going to be what? Infected. Blood transfusion. What else? Sex, right? What happens during sex? You have exchange of what? Body fluids. So therefore, we recommend what? Safe sex. Therefore, you have to bring with you all the time what? What? So, where is your condom now? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not kidding. This is not meant to be a job. People, oh, safe sex, safe sex, safe sex. And they don't even bring a condom with them. No, let me see if I have one here. <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. And you just imagine if my wife sees a condom, you know, you well, what? What is that for? I've already answered. Honey, I'm gonna use this for my students to show them how to the proper use of a condom. <laughs> Is this, put the condom like this. I always have a reason for everything I do. If there's a condom in my wallet, do I tell my wife? I'm gonna devastate it inside the classroom. <laughs> I'm just kidding, honey. Can you just imagine every time I put a condom there, it gets exposed to my hot body, <laughs> it might melt and every time, can you imagine, and, oh my God, if a condom will have a hold, that woman will get and develop HIV or I have a choice. <laughs> but that is B, C, O, D. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now why is hepatitis so important to learn? Because when you become nurses, are you going to be injected with, before you work in the hospital against hepatitis B? Can hepatitis B kill you? Yes. When you develop what we call fulminant hepatitis, you could be dead in a couple of days. Last one person in the world. I'm just joking, of course. He didn't get the joke, it's okay. <laughs> 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 
another thing about hepatitis B is this. There's a big chance that they've developed what into a chronic hepatitis and develop liver cirrhosis with scar tissue formation. And not only that, cancer of the liver. Hepatocellular carcinoma is more commonly seen in patients with what? Hepatitis B. I'm not saying all of them will develop it, but they might develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Is that life-threatening? Yes. You could be dead in a couple of weeks or days or months. Cancer of liver? No way, Jose. Okay. Okay. So, let me just go over this very quickly. Remember, if you recall, we talked about this a while ago. This is what? The GI tract? Mouth? Esophagus? Stomach? <laughs> Excuse me. The duodenum here and the genitum and the ileum, right? Small. And then the food goes into the wall. The wall contains muscle. The muscle contains blood vessels. The blood is found in the wall. So there is a hepatic what? Hepatic portal. portal vein. Who has many tributaries, right? So one of them is called the splenic vein. From what? From what organ? Spleen. Spleen. There's also what we call superior mesenteric vein from the GI tract here, right? What's the name of the vein? Superior, superior mesenteric vein. And then of course the inferior mesenteric vein of the lower GI tract system that goes to the splenic vein. And where all do these veins come from? Our goal to liver, in the right upper quadrant, to store the food we eat. Now what happens when you have hepatitis? Due to hepatitis B, C, or D, you develop cirrhosis. And what exactly do we mean by liver cirrhosis? Scar formation. So whenever you develop cirrhosis, what happens? You develop what? Scar. Tissue formation, fibrosis, cirrhosis, right? So it not, it, it's not only this, but can also what? Alcohol, right? How many have drink, um, how many have drink alcohol here? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> raising their, okay, there you are. <laughs> now, social drinking is fine. If you're looking for a boyfriend, you're single, fine. And ready to mingle. <laughs> social drinking, Dr. Gamma. But what happens if you keep on drinking every day? OMG. Oh, well, do you develop alcoholic cirrhosis, right, see? So what happens is that when you have scar formation here, will that affect the integrity of the liver cells or the hepatocyte, right? Scar here, scar there. So when the blood is supposed to go here, will the blood be able to enter the liver? No. And therefore, the blood will go back to the hepatic portal veins. What happens to the blood pressure in the hepatic portal veins? It will go up, it's called portal. Oh my God, you're so smart. What does hypertension mean? Why did the blood pressure go up? Because the blood that was supposed to go to the liver could not enter the liver because of cirrhosis and scar formation. It went back where? To the portal vein. That's the reason why you have portal hypertension. Now, I forgot to mention, there is a tributary coming from the what? Esophagus, right? From the stomach, esophagus called what? Esophageal vein. So if the blood cannot go here, there is retention and accumulation of blood there in the portal veins, you develop portal hypertension. Guess what happens? The blood will go back here to the spleen, you develop what? Splenomegaly. The blood will go back here, what happens? You develop varices or varicose veins, right? Where? In the wall of the esophagus. And what could happen to this esophageal viruses, if it keeps on, the blood pressure keeps on going, going up, going up, can that burst yes. and rupture? Can you vomit blood? Yes. Can you have blood in your stool? Yes. And what is the term used when you vomit blood? Hemal, hemal, emesis. What is emesis? Emesis means to vomit. Hemal means blood. And then you have blood in your stool. What is the term you use? There are two types. Milena or melina, and then what? Hematochesia. What is the normal color of your stool? Golden brown. <laughs> have you ever noticed how gold it is? I used to make a joke about this. I have a lot of friends who are 
They're caregivers. They're not nurses, but they're caregivers. So I tell them, think of it very positively. Every time you dig, especially <laughs> if a patient has constipation and has bowel obstruction, we need to what? Manual extraction. It's called, I call it gold digging, you know? <laughs> Gloves, KY, and then what? Have to manually extract this, the stool. If, especially if the, <laughs> the suppositories and the uh, laxative do not work, right? Or, so ideally when you do this, I, I tell them, you know what? Think of it positively. Every time you get that stool there, think of it as gold. That's $1, $2. I don't know how much they are paid, but do you understand? Now, going back to this, so ruptured RSS, vomit, splenomegaly, and what happens? Because they will now be enlarged. What happens to your red blood cell, white blood cell count, and platelet count? They drop. they drop. Why? Because the platelet will go there, the red blood cell will go there, the white blood cell goes there, you develop pancytopenia, which means your red blood cell count, white blood cell count, platelet count will all go down. Because the spleen, when you have hypersplenism, will sequester, will trap all these cells here. Although the plate is not even a cell, that's why your plate that count goes down. You'll be prone to bleeding. What else? You have what? The red blood cell count, you have anemia, and of course, white blood cell leukopenia. Do you understand? Okay? And then because of the hemorrhoidal veins, you develop what? Hemorrhoids, and you can have what they call the caput medusae. Now, you, have, you can research on that if you want. Okay? So, for those people like you or young, alcohol is good for social drinking, but too much drinking can cause permanent damage. You end up with a problem like this, so be aware of that. Even your loved ones, your parents, tell them, your father, your brother, whoever is drinking too much, okay? That's good for them. And of course, hepatitis, be aware of the spread that it can cause by what? Safe, practicing safe sex, right? Okay. Now, what exactly is, you know what's reflux, right? In reflux, the problem is what? In the sphincter. What's the name of the sphincter? Gastroesophageal sphincter, right? Or lower esophageal sphincter, or cardiac sphincter, because what do you call the first part of the stomach? Cardiac region. There's a cardiac orifice or opening. And what guards that opening here? The cardiac sphincter. It's a circular muscle. The moment the food enters from the esophagus to the stomach, what does the sphincter do? Contract to prevent what? Back flow or reflux or what? Regurgitation. Once the food enters the stomach, will it be mixed with the hydrochloric acid? Yes. So can you imagine if the food mixed with hydrochloric acid goes back to the esophagus, will that lead to reflux esophagitis? Okay. And what exactly is that? Inflammation of the esophagus as a result of exposure to what? The very powerful hydrochloric acid. Will that cause you to have chest pain or what we call heartburn? In patients with a heartburn, is a problem in the heart or the esophagus? Esophagus. And you have to give antacids and all this treatment for that, right? Now, briefly, in patients with gastric ulcer, the ulcer is in the stomach. What about duodenal ulcer? In the duodenal or peptic ulcer disease. There are two factors involved. In the stomach, remember this name of that bacteria that is supposedly associated with gastric ulcers? Helicobacter. Is it helicobacter or helicopter? <laughs> helicobacter, bacteria. Helicobacter pylori, because it's found where? In the pylorus, which is the last part of the stomach. P -O -P -P -Y -L -O -R -I. P-Y-L-O-R-I. Pylori. Helicobacter pylori. And of course, hyperacidity. You understand what I'm saying? So a combination of both infection. When I was a medical student a long, long time ago, like Star Wars, in a far, far <laughs> galaxy, <laughs> I think of myself as so old, you know. In 1985, I graduated from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. Oh my God. We never knew about this H. pylori. What is that? So at that time, if you give somebody an antibiotic for stomach ulcer, they would say, are you crazy? But now we know better. In fact, there are two people who discovered that. All they did was that could do a gastroscopy, get specimens, specimens, and they, oh, Eureka! They have the same organism called H. pylori, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. Two million dollars, I think. Woo! Do you understand? Now we know better. H. pylori plus hyperacidity. You understand? 
Now, why is it dangerous to have hyper or um, stomach ulcers? Can that bleed? Because when the ulcer gets deeper from the mucosa to the submucosa, smooth muscle, where the blood vessels are found, it can now bleed. Does it make sense? Again, you can either have hematemesis or blood in the stool. Remember I said, what, what is melina? Black tar stools. The bleeding is so slow from the upper GI tract. On the other hand, lower GI bleeding means what? From the lower below the duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and everything below. Lower GI bleeding or LGIB, not LGBT, LGIB. Lower GI bleeding. You can have what? Hematochesia, fresh blood. An example would be what? Ulcerative colitis. Or when you have what? Hemorrhoids. I remember. And I asked the young man, oh my God, there's blood in my stool. <gasps> I'm not having natural flow, am I? No. <laughs> I did get a joke, it's okay. <laughs> now, so the idea therefore is that that becomes a life-threatening condition, right? Okay, what else? Okay, gastritis is inflammation of the stomach because maybe of course something you eat, like many of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin can do that, right? Okay. And of course, we talked about the viruses. Of course, what is acute gastroenteritis? Like food poisoning, and you start to vomit, stomach pain, and you have diarrhea, okay? And colic pain, right? Now, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, I think there will be people talking about that too. Not talk about. Now, what is appendicitis? Inflammation of what? Yeah, the appendix, and it's found in the right lower quadrant, right? So anybody with right lower quadrant pain, would you consider appendicitis? Yes. They say normally it starts with the umbilical area, it starts to localize in the right lower quadrant. Mm -hmm. Now why is it so dangerous to have appendicitis? Because it can what? Rupture. And what is inside the appendix? S-H-I-T. What is S-H-I-T? Stool. Stool. Let's see now, what did you say? <laughs> Stool. Okay, so can you imagine if the appendix is attached to the cecum, which is part of the large intestine, which contains stool, Ruptures, all the stool will be everywhere. It can lead to what? Peritonitis or inflammation of the peritoneum. And therefore what? Two things. Board like, you know, wooden board, rigid, rigidity of the abdominal wall. Second, there will be what? The pain that used to be localized in the right lower cardinal becomes now what? Generalized, Generalized all over the place. It's the reason why when you have a rupture dependent, it gets worse because you could have infection, severe septicemia. And when you go to the hospital, you have to do surgery, stop. You know what stop means? Immediately. We do a, oh my God, I remember those good old days. I trained in a very big hospital called the Philippine Jail Hospital. At two in the morning, you have to admit the patient, you have to do emergency OR. And all I do, because I wasn't in there, is just hold one. Retract, retract, retract for two to three hours. But the only consolation I have, because right beside me is a beautiful nurse. At two in the morning, I don't mind looking at her. And I was still single, ready to mingle, you know. And then we had my wife there at that time. So we track, we track, we track. And what do they do? They pull everything. Oh my God, can you imagine 20 feet long of small intestine? And then they see the planning around, cut, remove, repair. And then, you know, you go to a car wash, right? Water, soap, water, saline, saline, stereo, and then get the suction, and stool, stool, in the, oh my God. Those were the days, interesting times. And all I do was retract. The only consolation is that the beautiful nurses or the female beautiful surgeon, I don't mind retracting and looking at her. If it's a male surgeon, oh shit. Oh. It's good like this. <laughs> then, hey, Joel. <laughs> I wouldn't be looking at the male surgeon. <laughs> Honey, I'm just joking, of course. My wife will kill me now. <laughs> Do you understand, right? So is it a life threatening condition when you have a ruptured appendix? Yes. yes. Septicemia, septic shock, you die. Okay. Okay, what about, oh, Hirschsprung disease is just what? Megacolon. There's a lack of nerve cells in the muscles, so they don't conduct, they develop big megacolon, right? Uh, Galsong, by the way, right? 
So where's your gallbladder? It's right behind the pancreas. Oh, it's uh, it's, it's uh, in the area where you have the liver, by the way. Okay, liver, gallbladder. You have right upper quadrant pain. Take off what? Gallbladder stone. You could radiate to the back. Now, what's amazing? Because now we have this one. So coli, coli, lithiasis. What does lithiasis mean? Stone, L-I-T-H-I-A-S-I-S, coli pertaining to the gallbladder, is gallbladder stone or gallstones. Now the problem in gallstones is this. If this is the liver here, right? This is the gallbladder here, cystic duct, hepatic duct. The hepatic duct of the liver and the cystic duct of the gallbladder will go on. Common bowel duct where? To the duodenum, like this, right? Yeah. To release the bile. What what organ produces the bile? Liver. What organ stores the bile? God. What does what does the liver do? Produce the bile. What to store the bile? God daughter. So when you have God stones here, what do the stones do? <coughs> Cause biliary obstruction. What do you mean biliary obstruction? Bile. Biliary, bile duct, hepatic duct, cystic duct, common bile duct. Bile, go to, 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 store there. And whenever there is fat, the bile is released like squirted, whoosh, to what? To emulsify the fat, to allow the mixing of the fatty oil with water, so that the fat will be absorbed where? Into the wall, because the wall contains water, the blood, and the blood vessels. Remember, can you mix fatty oil with water? No, only in the presence of something that will emulsify, M-U-L-S-I-F-Y, which is your what? Your bile. Okay, now, if you have gas cells there, if you have biliary obstruction, this gets bigger because the bile can no longer go out, you develop cholecystitis, can that also burst? Yes. yes? Can that cause a lot of pain? Mm -hmm. Can that cause infection? Yes. So what do we do? Cholecystectomy. What is cholecystectomy? Removal. So you got removal. Now, when I was a medical student in the 1980s, very long incision, a couple of hours, maybe two or three hours, you have to stay for a week. Now, I call it what? In and out burger surgery. Remember in and out? You go in, you go out. It means they perform the surgery at seven in the morning, and then maybe a four, like three or four or five hours later, you can go home. It's called what? Have you heard about this? Laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Laparoscopic, they have three or four holes. They put a surgical instrument, they, they cause pneumoperitoneum, pushes the organs to the side, the gas, and of course, you can know what? Cut the gallbladder, remove, tie, ligate, suture, goodbye. Because you have three holes. Go home. Who is happy? Kaiser and all the other hospitals, why? You spend less time in the hospital, Less expense on their part, more money on their. Ah, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Because business is business. Is the running of a hospital a business? Yes. Who gets richer, the doctor or then the owners of the hospital? Look at their parking spaces. Oh my God, they're bigger. They're type, ten times bigger than this building, right? We should put up our own business then, huh? Gamo, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, now. I'm just joking. I am just as a poor man. Now. Okay, so do you have anything about, so cholecystectomy, the only probably thing, I have not undergone that procedure, maybe what, maybe 30 minutes to one hour. I'd like it for it to be very long. So they just go in, remove, and you can actually go on the same day. Isn't it amazing? You young people are so lucky that you have all these procedures that can be done in such a short span of time, right? Okay? You understand? Yes. Okay, so I think that's all we can do now. Now, pancreatitis is something, uh, no, somebody asked me before, what happens if you remove the gallbladder? Will you die? You won't. Because now, instead of the bile store being stored, it will not just go directly up into the small intestine or duodenum. In other words, you can live without your gallbladder. Now, who wants to volunteer? I can remove your gallbladder now for free. <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. Okay? Is that clear, class? Now, pancreatitis, 
the only thing I can say about pancreatitis is this. There's what we call hemorrhagic pancreatitis, and it's really true. Many of these cases are due after a drinking binge, like, you know, drink a lot of beer and all this thing, remember? Drink a lot of alcohol, and it causes the release of pancreatic enzyme that lipase. The problem with hemorrhagic pancreatitis is that the pancreas develop hemorrhages, and what happens to all the enzymes inside the pancreas? They go out of the pancreas and eat everything in its path. All the organs there. Can you die? So what is the bottom le moral lesson here? And normally they die during their sleep. So they think it's a <laughs> You're absolutely right. No. You give your drinks to me, I will sell it, we'll have the profit. I'm a businessman. No, I'm just kidding. If you have to drink, maybe in moderation, do not go to the point of passing out, you know? Or black out, or what? I don't call, I don't know what they term to use in the, this, in the confirmation hearings now of the judge. Black out, pass out, I don't know. Because in the first place, I don't even like alcohol. How many of you like the taste of alcohol? I mean, I don't. I don't know why people like to drink alcohol. And I used to remember when I would drink with my fraternity brother, I would just go like this. I was a good acting. I would finish one bottle of beer in five hours. <laughs> That's how good I was in acting. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes, of course, my, my really close friend would drink a lot and I think yeah, I go like this. But there are times I just pretend because I don't really like drink, but just for fun with brothers, you drink and you see a, a naked, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> like places like that down there, you know. Oh my God, those were the days of my youth. Okay. You have any questions? So, <laughs> Mr. Ibrahim is laughing at me. Mr. Ibrahim, huh? You're laughing at me. Okay, so let's have a break, and after a while, five minutes, we come back, okay?